Okay, so let's get started. Um, it's 1400, so everyone who's late is late. Um, so welcome to the tutorial. This is the Cypher tutorial. Um, I'm Stefan Benel, uh, one of the core developers of Cypher. So this is kind of a, uh, you can actually ask me anything session. Um, uh, I'm also a Cypher trainer, so I give, give trainings, especially at the Python Academy in Leipzig. Um, you can find more about that at the Python Academy or at uh, my webpage there. Um, I hope you've all downloaded the notebook that I'm going to present here. Anyone not prepared? Who dares? <laughs> That's fine. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay. Uh, first of all, what is Cython? Um, Cython is, well, it's, it's a Python compiler, basically, first of all. Uh, it translates Python code to C code. Okay, so you can write native code uh, in Python syntax. Um, and the cool twist about it is uh, that because it's translated into C or C++, um, it allows you to directly uh, interact with C code, with native code, C++ code, C code, um, with libraries, uh, it allows you to write uh, C and C++ code without actually writing C code. Um, so that's the, the cool thing about it. It's an actual programming language, and many people use it um, to wrap libraries for Python uh, or to speed up their code uh, into native code. Um, but uh, some people also just use it, you know, because it's a program language. They use it as a program language, as they, like they would use Python, um, but as a kind of a cool program language that makes many things easier uh, than in other native languages. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to use uh, a Jupyter Notebook for the tutorial. Uh, and the first thing you would do in the notebook in order to enable Cython support, because Cython is actually one of the languages that uh, Jupyter supports, you would say load X Cython. And if you have Cython installed, then this will enable Cython compiled cells. So I'll do that. And it tells me I should restart my kernel. Um, up. Okay. So I'll just try again. Up. It's not going to tell me anything. And it's imported Cyton. OK, cool. Uh, the next thing I put in there is just a quick uh, you know, um, um, a summary of what dependencies you have installed. Um, so I'm using the latest uh, Cyton master. Actually, you probably don't have that installed. Uh, so it's perfectly fine if you use uh, Cyton 026 or even 25, that'll, that'll be OK for this tutorial. Um, I'm using Python 306. Is anyone using Python 2? OK. Uh, you're excused. <laughs> so that's kind of fine, too. Um, Cython supports uh, Python 2.6 and later up to uh, 3.7. So we continuously uh, um, uh, test against the latest development versions of uh, CPython in order to stay compatible. Um, and that means uh, whatever code you write in Cython um, uh, will be adapted by us uh, to newer Python versions for you. So you don't have to do much there. Um, the kind of recent, recent NumPy version. Um, one thing to know about Cython is it compiles code to C. So you need a C compiler or a C++ compiler installed in order to make any actual use of it. Does anyone not have a C compiler installed? Uh, OK. <laughs> person up there, everyone else has it. That's fine. Um, so you will need this for this tutorial. Um, because the, the way the compilation works is Cython takes your Python or Cython code, uh, translates it into C, and then the C compiler translates that into a shared library, into an uh, um, an extension module that you can then import and use in Python. OK, that's the way it works. So you have a three-step uh, process. Um, the nice thing about the, the Jupyter Notebook is that it, it's uh, 
removes most of that, so you can just write Cython code in the cell, uh, run it, and it'll be compiled in the back, and you won't see anything about it, and it's just going to get executed and imported, and it's all there. Okay, you'll see that. Really nice. Okay. Um, regarding questions in this tutorial, you can ask questions at any time. Please just interrupt me. Uh, when there's anything you want to know, uh, I'll try to answer anything. Well, no, not anything. Like, you know what I mean. Um, okay. Here's a very simple example. Uh, this is just normal Python code. I'm using the, the Python math module, uh, specifically the sine function from it, and just calculating sine of 5. It gives you minus uh, 0.9. Um, so uh, that's simple. You would probably know that. And I can do the same thing in Cython because Cython can translate uh, and compile arbitrary Python code. So I'll just do that there. And the first thing you notice, you don't get any output. Why is that? Um, what Cython does in the back is it compiles your module, and the module gets imported as an extension module, and it actually gets executed. But uh, the Jupyter Notebook does not see what the, the kind of the, the last line in your code was. Okay, so it, it can't just uh, say, I got this result and I'll present it to you. Uh, instead, this, uh, the code in there gets executed as a, as a module. Okay, and there's no standard output of modules. Um, so what I can do instead is uh, I can say print the result here and it's going to be printed for me. Okay, and that's the difference. Um, so this is, is fairly simple. This is just still uh, plain Python code. Um, what I can do in Cython now is instead of using the, uh, the Python math module, I can actually use the, uh, the math support in the C library. So libc math header. Um, uh, Cython comes with uh, all declarations that you need for that. Uh, so um, instead of having to declare anything anywhere, anywhere um, I can just say C import. So that's uh, an extension uh, to what you would see in Python. Um, it's a compile time import. Okay, so there's a couple of extensions to the Python language that uh, you use, use in, in, in the Cython language. Uh, so one of them is C import, which gives you a static import, a uh, compile time import. And I'm using the libc math module here. And then I'm taking the sign function of that. And that's the actual uh, low level C sign function. OK? And what I'm doing here is I'm taking that function and I'm assigning it to a variable uh, called sign function. Um, and this is a global module variable, meaning it's a Python variable. OK? So what I end up with is a module that defines a name sign function, which represents the C sign function and exports it to Python. Okay, so I can just take that and call it from my notebook. And here I'm using the C sign function directly from Python. Because this is kind of the, the quickest way to export a simple function, I would say, a simple C functions uh, into Python. Okay, what this does more or less is it defines a Python function, uh, which internally calls the C sign function, and it takes a double and returns a, a, so a C double, okay, and it returns a C double result. And that's hidden behind this assignment here, and here I've spelled it out. Um, this is actually Cython syntax, so Cython allows me to define Python functions, but declare the signature in a C way. Okay. When I execute this, uh, it defines my C sign function, and I can run that from Python. Okay. Um, so what you can see here is that uh, this, this is actually a very uh, basic property of the Cython language. It mixes Python and C freely, right? So um, most of the, the code that you will see, in like, most of the Cython code that you'll ever see, will um, uh, do some, some, use some Python features here, use some Python objects here, uh, then push something into C, do stuff there, call a C function, get a return, um, and f like literally mix Python and C all over the place. And that makes Cython such a cool language for many things because um, you get the simplicity of Python on one side, and on the other side, 
um, you got all the native power of C, okay, in one programming language. Um, okay, one nice debugging feature of Cython is, um, well, here we've seen, I've declared a, a Cython cell in Jupyter. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm passing the minus A uh, parameter to that uh, cell, and in addition to compiling my code now, what it'll do is it'll uh, analyze and annotate, that's what the A is for, uh, my code, and then output it as an HTML fragment down here uh, that tells me how the compiler saw my code and what it made of it. So, um, for example, um, when I click on this line with a plus here of the uh, signature definition, then you'll see that there was a lot of code generated from Cython just, um, just to implement this Python function for me. Okay? Um, and then down here, I can actually prove that it calls the C sign function because the C code says I take the variable x, call the C sign function on it directly, then take the result and turn it into a uh, Python float. So that was what this function is doing, pi float from C double, okay? Um, and then re return the result as a normal Python float object, okay? And Cython generates these things automatically for you because it knows the result of a sign of the sign function here is declared as a C double, but it is used in a Python context. It is returned from Python function, uh, function so it must be an object, um, and it automatically converts between the two uh, value types for you behind the scenes. Okay. Now, um, uh, this is very basic, uh, and as I said, this can be done just by assigning the C function to a Python variable. Um, when it becomes a bit more interesting when you do more stuff on the C side. Um, so what I'm doing here is uh, I'm, I'm getting a double value in again, but then I'm taking the square of that, and I'm taking the sine of the square. So this is uh, uh, implementing sine of square of the input, um, and it's doing all that in C space again. Okay, so when I compile this, and I actually compile it with Cython minus A, again, then you see that um, this line down here is really just plain C multiplication, uh, and then we take the result and call the sine function on it. Okay. Um, and this is something you'll also uh, often see um, in many uh, wrapper generators uh, that you find for Python, say, um, well, there, there are many of them. Uh, in, in many of those, um, what you get is you get a, a plain wrapper around some C function, some C functionality, okay? And uh, then you have to deal with whatever that gives you in Python. Um, and Cython allows you to make that wrapper uh, thin if you like, but thicker if you need it, okay? And that's completely seamless. So whenever you need more functionality or you want to aggregate some, some uh, C functionality um, behind some Python function call, for example, or uh, hide it behind a Python class, you can easily do that by just implementing the thing in, in Python and then calling whatever C functionality you need uh, straight from your code. Okay, so if you find that... Yeah, right, I didn't declare cdef. Okay, uh, so cdef um, is another extension you've seen C import. Uh, cdef is the other basic thing that you'll see all over the place in Cython code. Uh, it just says this is a C definition. Okay, and what this does here is it declares the variable x square as uh, having the C type double. Okay, that's all it does. Okay, in fact, I wouldn't even need that because uh, Cython is smart enough to do type inference here. Um, I have two double values here, so uh, multiplying them obviously results in a C double, and I wouldn't need to declare the result type of the variable, but I did. Yeah, yeah, it should be. So there's a bit of, of type inference available in, in Cython, um, which, which helps to avoid having to declare too many things. Okay, um, so that was a really uh, tiny, quick intro. Um, let's come to a bigger example. Um, so uh, I owe this example to, uh, s to a guy called um, 
Caleb Hetting, who uh, presented a Cython tutorial at uh, PyCon Australia a couple of years ago. Um, and I found it a very nice example. Um, why? Well, everyone likes taxes, right? Um, so I borrowed that idea from him, and what I did was uh, I looked up the actual tax calculation function that we have uh, here in, in Germany. Um, and I found that there are currently, uh, so for the last year, there were something like 44 million taxpayers, uh, so earners, uh, in this country, and the average income of them was uh, 3,703 euros per month, so times 12, that's about what you get uh, as an average income per year. Uh, so I'll just run this, and that's the average income. Um, and then I started looking a bit for uh, actual data that backed this number, and didn't really find anything. So I'll just, for, this, for the sake of this tutorial, I'll just create some alternative facts here. Um, and I'm sure all of you are happy with that. It's the right conference to do that. Um, so I'll just assume that, first of all, there are only a 20th of the number of people, just to keep the calculations a bit faster, um, and uh, a log normal distribution for the income. Okay, so you can see that the average is about right, and there's a, um, a well alternative minimum income and a maximum income here. When I plot this, uh, you can see that uh, well that's about what you would expect more or less uh, from the uh, income distribution. Well, more or less. Okay. Um, so let's cal calculate everyone's taxes. Mm -hmm. I looked up the uh, tax formula in Wikipedia, and this is what it gave me. It actually gave me an Excel implementation of that formula. So I took that formulation and uh, rephrased it in Python, and this is essentially it. So if your income is above that number, then it's calculated like this. Otherwise, you know, there's uh, it's, 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 it's a staged calculation. And that's also what makes it kind of interesting because this is difficult to express in simple terms. Uh, the best way to express this is actually with ifs. Okay? Um, so this is how you would express it in Python. Uh, and uh, then you can calculate the average income down here and the average tax rate. Uh, across the data that we have, you'll probably get slightly different results because you know it's um, alternative facts uh, on your side too. But this is about the uh, the uh, well the average income and the calculated tax, uh, the average tax, and then um, I'll just do the whole thing in Python, and you can see that the average tax rate is about. 24% for my data set. Okay, so when I ask time it how long that took, um, it's gonna tell me some number after a while, after a couple of seconds, or maybe a couple more seconds. Or some more seconds. Well, you see, it actually takes quite a while in Python. Um, and time it uh, runs it a couple of times in order to, to get accurate results. And then it tells me that it's about a uh, bit more than, than three seconds. Okay? So let's uh, say that's one for zero in milliseconds. Um, I'll just remember that value. Um, and then in order to make things comparable while I'm on the way of optimizing stuff, uh, I'm calculating the ratio, uh, ratios uh, along the way, and I'm saying that Python is my base level, and um, that's the slowest version I probably come up with. Um, the next thing I did was I found a way to express the whole thing in NumPy, uh, and this is how it, what, what I got there. Uh, basically, it's, it's selecting parts of the array that match these conditions, and then doing the calculation for the, uh, the income ranges based on that. Okay? So I can calculate the whole thing on NumPy segments and then sum them up separately uh, and calculate the average from that. And you can see that it gives me about the same uh, um, average uh, tax rate, 24%. Uh, and when I ask how long that took, it's 
going to be much faster. Um, so that's uh, 57 mi milliseconds. And now I notice that I forgot one thing. Uh, whenever you benchmark, one thing you should never forget is switch off uh, the energy management. Uh, so I'll rerun the Python version again, and it's again going to take a couple of seconds. So I'll get a proper result there now. It probably shouldn't be very much different uh, because it's, it's running for so long, so the, the processor will scale up uh, during that time. And I'm probably getting good results from that anyway. But the faster it runs, uh, the less likely it becomes that my uh, CPU is going to be at full speed. Right? Because it's going to take a while until the power management notices um, that my CPU is actually uh, being used, like heavily used, and only then it's going to scale up. And so I'm getting skewed results. But this is about what I had before. Okay, so I'll just keep the old value there. Um, and then I'll rerun the NumPy version again. Um, and then yeah, it's still about the same thing. So um, that is 58.1 milliseconds. And you can see that's already 54 times faster than the Python version. OK? That is pretty good. OK. Um, the same thing can be done with a NumPy U func uh, by simply taking my Python function and applying it to all elements in the array. Uh, so I'll do that here. Uh, that's a from PyFunk function in NumPy um, in, to which I can pass my function in order to, com uh, to uh, convert it into UFunk. Um, and then when I apply that to the whole array and sum up the results, I get the same text rate. Uh, and time it on that is going to be much slower than the, uh, than the slicing version, but still much faster than the pure Python version. Okay. So I'll remember that that took uh, 818 milliseconds. And um, so now the NumPy version is way faster than that. Uh, and the Python version uh, is, is only about four times slower. OK, let's get back to Python then. Um, up to now, this is pretty much what you would be able to achieve from Python as well, given the, the tools that we just had, so using plain NumPy. Um, now, what Python allows you to do is you can take the Python version of your code and compile it into C. Um, this is usually not going to give you a big effect, uh, simply because um, it's still going to use Python objects. It's still going to call Python functions along the way. Um, so there is not much out of the box this Python can do for you. Um, so when I just take the Python code that I implemented above, uh, copy it straight in there, it's exactly the same thing, um, and now use a Python cell instead of a plain Python cell, so I get the same thing, uh, compiled with Python, and um, I can now call that on the list of incomes. Should get the same results, 24%. And when I call time it on that, um, it's going to take a while. And then we can see how it compares to the, the plain uncompiled Python version. And that's 275.0 milliseconds. And it's still about 15% faster than the plain Python version, just by compiling it, right? just by adding one line at the top of the uh, Jupyter cell, which is OK. Right? I mean, I didn't really do anything. Right? I didn't care. I mean, I just dropped code in, and it just got 15% faster. That's, if that's for free, that's fine. Um, OK, but the cool thing about Python now is that I can start optimizing my code at a much deeper level, at a native level, uh, rather than at a Python level. I have m many things that I can do at a C level that can make it run much faster than um, what I can achieve in Python. And the first thing I would do is I add static typing. So you've already seen the, the CDEF declarations um, and the signature changes that I made. Uh, I can now start declaring 
variables as having C types instead of Python object types. Okay. So here's uh, the same code copy again. And now um, what I'll do is uh, I'll start annotating, I'll start changing the code and annotating it with uh, static types uh, with the goal of making it faster. So the first thing I'll obviously do is I know that the income is probably a double. So that can be safely represented as a C double. And um, I know down here, well, this is a list. It's working on a list and it's taking the sum. Um, and what I see here is uh, down here, it's calling this function a lot of times in a generator expression. So it's running over the incomes in order to uh, calculate the taxes. It's running over the incomes in order to calculate the, t uh, the sum. And when I see something like this, the first thing I would say is this can be done much faster by running over the list once and doing the calculation in one step. Okay? So I'll change this into a loop. I'll just, I'll just spell out the for loop that is hidden in this, uh, this expression down here. Um, and I'll say uh, for income in incomes, um, my tax is, uh, uh, so you can follow this, but the actual implementation of this is, is right below. Okay, so you have the, the whole thing, the whole solution down there. Um, so you can follow this, what I'm doing here, uh, in order to see your own results. And if you're only interested in the results, you can just execute the cell, like a couple of cells below, just so you know. Okay, um, so I'll spell out the, the expression here uh, as, a, as a single loop. Uh, and that means um, my text sum is going to be uh, the sum of incomes, uh, well, the sum of calling the function on my income. So for each of the income values, uh, I calculate the tax, sum up the taxes, and the total is the total of incomes. And then down here, I will say uh, the final result is the tax sum by the total, right? That's pretty much it. In order to make that fast, um, what I'll do is I'll declare all variables in here as having proper double values so that the whole calculation can actually be done in C space. So all variables that I'm using here, the tax sum, uh, the total, and the income itself uh, are all going to be C variables. Which ones do you mean? Like these up here? Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on. It depends on the context. Um, so what I, I did here is I already declared. So in the inside of my function, I already declared the uh, income argument as a C double. And that means that all comparisons down here will be done uh, in C space using C doubles. And Cython will infer the uh, C double type for this variable, for this, sorry, for the constant also, because that's what it's comparing. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the, the way the coercion then works is, is C style. So if you compare an integer with a double, then the results, the vari values will be compared as doubles. Okay. If income was just a plain Python variable, then this would be a, a Python literal, and it would use object comparison. Okay. Okay. So, um, what have I done so far? I'll drop the last line now, and uh, what you can see now is all variables are doubled. Um, the function is still called. We're summing up the values that we get back from the function call. We're summing up the totals, and we do the total calculation in the end. So I just compile it, this as it is, and see if the output is still the same. It will still 24%, and that looks right. And when I call time it on that, 
It's going to run for a while. And it should already be a bit faster. Quite a bit faster. So we're down to 139 milliseconds now. And that compared to the plain compiled version is a factor, factor of 20 faster. Okay. Question. Um, those uh, uh, variables that you initialize, um, the C depths in the mm -hmm. average tax rate. I should initialize them. Yeah. Well, so what was it doing if, it, if those weren't initialized? Was it you doing um, just taking random? I, I suppose I was lucky, and they were initialized to zero, but that means I was just lucky. But it's basically what the compiler does, yeah. right? Yeah, what the C compiler does internally. Yes, because there are options. If you heavily optimize, it's not initialized. If you try to debug, then it's initialized. If you're Something like that, yeah. Yeah, so I should probably initialize them, and it shouldn't make a difference for me in this case. Just run it again. I mean, I get the same result, right? So it's, it was still correct. Yeah, same result. Okay, there's one more thing I can do. Uh, when I run this through Cython minus A, and let Cython tell me what it did, um, I'm seeing a couple of things here. Uh, and you've already noticed the yellow lines, I guess. Uh, there are white lines, yellow lines, all this. Um, and the level of yellowness in this output tells me how much Python interaction there is going on. So any white line actually tells me plain C code here, and everything that's kind of white, kind of yellow to dark yellow means there's some kind of, of Python runtime interaction, some object operations going on. Okay? So apparently I'm not at the point yet where I've turned my code into native code, because there are still tons of uh, uh, yellow lines in there, and even just the calculations here seem yellow. Why is that? When I click on them, I can see that the actual calculation um, based on the income variable is done in C. So income times value minus something, uh, but then the result is converted into a Python float. So what I forgot to do is um, this function is still a Python function. It's still called as a Python function. Uh, it's using Python semantics for being called, so it's using argument tuples for input, uh, and it's using object for output. Okay? And that is inefficient since I'm only using this function internally inside of my program. I'm not really exporting it to anything. I don't care who else is going to use it. I just want to, this function to be called as fast as possible inside of my program. Um, and for that, I can turn the whole function into a C function by changing the declaration. Uh, now it's a def function, a Python function, and I can turn it into a C def function, which makes it a C function. Okay? And now it's a static C function inside of my module. Um, in case people were still using it from the outside, uh, I can use a third type of function, that's a CP def function. Um, which turns it into a C function with a Python wrapper. So it's still usable from Python. Uh, if it's just a C def function, then it's only usable statically as a C function inside of my module. Okay? Um, so here, I'm actually going to use a CP def function. It doesn't make a big difference, uh, but it still keeps the function visible from Python code. And now, since it's a C function, I can declare the return type. I don't have to. If I don't declare it, then it's still object. But uh, since I know that the return type is actually double, a C double, I can just spell it out and say, this function is a C function. It gets a C double as input and returns a C double. OK? If it's a CP def, so it's Python that, does that mean like when you call it from Python, uh, it'll still return a C double, but then Python will convert that to a... Yes. So the question was, um, when is the CPDEF, uh, what does the Python wrapper actually do? And what it does is, it, well, it's a complete wrapper, so it, wraps the, it unwraps the input. It gets objects as input, or one object in this case, unpacks it into a C double, so you can pass in a Python float or a Python integer. Uh, they'll just be 
convert it into a C int, uh, sorry, C double in this case. Um, then the calculation will be done, and on the output, uh, the result of that is a C double. And since we are calling it from Python, the wrapper will re uh, convert the C double return value back into a Python float object. Okay. Yeah. So if it's if it's called from Cython code, then that's exactly what the CPDEF is for. Uh, s calls from inside of Cython are fast. They use the C interface. They use the C function. Call it directly. Do not go through the wrapper. Um, and they uh, the advantage of that is they actually see the signature. So if you pass a uh, C double into that function um, into a CPDEF function, then the caller will see that. Uh, the call function actually expects a C double. There's no conversion needed. It'll just pass it through at the C level as fast as it can. Um, and the C compiler will see that and may even inline the call or do whatever optimization it can. Um, and the output is a C double. No conversion needed either. You just get a C double back all done. That's it. OK? That's, um, that way you get the fastest possible call inside of Cython without losing the ability to use the function from Python, from the outside uh, Python world. OK, so I'll uh, compile that. And actually, and I, now you can see that the whole function dropped um, into C. So all the return values are now plain C double returns. Um, and uh, even down here, uh, that was previously a bit yellow because the return value was a Python object and it had to be converted back into a C double in order to sum it up. And now you can see that the function call is a C call, that the, um, there's no input conversion going on, no output conversion. Uh, any Python uh, usage that's uh, still left in this function is the iteration over the incomes list. And that's it. Okay. OK, I've compiled this. Still gives me the same result. And I call time it on it. Previously, we had 139 milliseconds. Now we're down to 30 milliseconds for the whole thing. OK. And so the ratio changed um, to a factor of 90 compared to the com previously compiled function, un annotated function, and to a factor of 105 compared to the plain Python implementation. OK. Any questions here? Well, the reason why the for loop is in yellow is that we're iterating over a Python list. So the input is a Python list, and the iteration needs to step from value to value through the list. But this is already faster in Cython than it is in Python, because Cython understands what a Python list is and it can unpack it at the C level and just iterate over the, the, the underlying C array of objects. Okay, so the, the conversion there, the iteration and the conversion there is very fast. Um, so why is the last line still yellow? Let me go back up. Um, this is a Python function. So I'm calling it from Python, using it from my Jupyter Notebook as a Python function. And so the return value here um, you can see that the text sum divided by the total uh, is being uh, evaluated in C space. Another thing you can see from the C code is that the total is first checked for zero, and you get a zero division error if the total happens to be zero. Okay, so if I pass in uh, an empty list into this function, I will get an exception and not a crash in C. Right? Wonderful. Um, OK, so there's a bit of exception handling going on here, uh, which is very fast, because this is just a C value comparison. Um, and the final conversion of the result uh, for returning the result is also done um, in, is, is using uh, a Python operation for creating a float object. But that's it. The, the whole calculation up to that point is happening in C now. Okay. The question was, can I declare a list of doubles for the incomes? Um, no, I can't. Uh, so there's currently no way to express 
So what I could say is um, uh, this here is a list. I could even say this is a list and it's definitely not none. So this is also something I can express in Cython syntax. Um, what this does is um, it does a type check on the way in. And if the input value is none, then it'll raise, I think, a type error. And if it's not a list, it'll, you get a value error, um, something like that. But it'll, it'll check the input and make sure it's definitely a Python list and nothing else. Um, uh, ha it has a tiny advantage because now Scython knows that it is a list and not maybe a tuple or maybe some iterable. Uh, previously, the code supported any iterable. Now it only supports Python lists. So that will uh, cut down the generated code a little because the loop code will be simpler, but it's probably not going to make a big difference. I can try it. So I just compile this and rerun the uh, benchmark, see what kind of a difference it makes. See, uh, it's really tiny, right? It's a couple of percent. Um, and that's because the uh, the looping, the for loop in Cython is so fast and has special handling for tuples, for lists. Uh, when you pass a list and it hits the fast path, this is a list, um, then you end up with very fast code, uh, despite not knowing at compile time that it was a list. Because Cython is just going to assume that most of the time what you're iterating over is probably a list. Right? So we're optimizing for that. Um, so, but the, the cool thing, if I leave this out, if I don't declare anything here for the incomes, uh, is it's still going to be about as fast, not a big difference, uh, but it's going to support any input, any iterable input, okay? Not just exactly Python lists. If I say um, this is a list, then it would not even accept uh, subtypes of lists, however unlikely they are, but it would re reject anything that's not a list. Okay, any more questions there? We'll come into that in a minute. That's right, the next thing. Okay, so we've seen, uh, we've already achieved a factor of 105 faster code by now, and it's already faster than the NumPy version by a factor of two. Okay. Um, so this is really nice, and uh, I think that's pretty much what I had implemented down here. Yeah, it looks exactly the same. Um, so uh, now, question to you. Um, we could now do an exercise here. I could let you do uh, kind of the same thing that I did on another function, optimize that. Do you want to do it, or do you want to continue? Me, or do you want me to continue um, kind of my, my show and tell presentation? Does anyone want to do the ex uh, the uh, the exercise? Clear majority. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll just keep going. Um, and you can still do the same thing, and we can talk about it uh, during the conference. Okay, so I'll leave this to you. And next uh, topic then is memory use. And that's the thing you wanted to, to hear about. Uh, so if I'm actually using, yeah. Um, question, is this the fastest version already? Well, since my tutorial is not finished yet, probably not. <laughs> um, so this is probably the fastest way to do it if your input is a Python list of, you know, numbers. Okay. Uh, okay. Question was, how does it compare to a fully native C implementation? Uh, you've seen uh, all white, all white lines. So the whole. Uh, operation, the whole calculation was actually done in C space. So you get exactly the same performance in C as you get for this Python code. It's just plain C in the end. You can try it. You can write a C version and then wrap that in Python and call it. Uh, 
Uh, does, does Cython use optimizing C compiler flags? Uh, Cython actually does not uh, configure your C compiler for you. What it does is it generates the C code. And then in this case, it's uh, the Jupyter integration that calls the C compiler in the back. And that uses your C flags, LD flags, whatever you have um, defined in your environment. So it's your responsibility to configure your C compiler properly. And if you know better C flags than it currently uses, just use them. OK. Um, so memory use. Uh, so the question, uh, um, uh, like two questions ago, was uh, what if the whole thing is stored in a NumPy array and not in a Python list? Um, this is actually a very common case. Uh, how often does it happen to you that you have actual data in a Python list rather than like in a pandas data frame or a NumPy array somewhere? It's probably quite likely that you'll hit the case that all these income values are already in NumPy array. Um, and Cython has special support for that. Um, so there is uh, a protocol in Python uh, that was added in, in Python 2.6 and Python 3. Um, back in the days of, that was like 2007, 2008, around that. So it's already about 10 years old now. Uh, and that's the buffer protocol. And that is something that is support, supported uh, natively by NumPy uh, and some other libraries out there. Um, and basically, whenever you're pushing around uh, big native data blobs in some way, it's probably going to support the buffer interface in one way or another. Uh, and so that's why Cython has native support for buffers. Um, so what it allows you to do is you can take a buffer, you can receive a buffer as input, uh, unpack it into the uh, C uh, memory, and just do some operation on the memory natively rather than going through some Python interface there. So it's, it's one shot, unpack operation, and from that point on you have native C memory. Um, it changes a bit the, uh, the interface here. What we previously had was we just had an object coming in, a Python list uh, in this case, and what we're going to change now is um, we're not going to use the Python list of data. We're going to use uh, the NumPy array of data that we have. And we pass it in and declare it to Cython, to the Cython compiled function as a memory view on that data. And that's a special syntax for that, which is says uh, it's a one dimensional array of doubles. That's it. That's how you declare a memory view. And now what Cython knows from that is uh, there's some object coming in which supports the buffer interface. Um, it knows that the items in that object, in that memory, are C doubles, have the format of a C double. Uh, it's one dimensional. And if whatever it gets in is not one dimensional, it's going to reject it. It's going to say, told you error, wrong input. Um, but if it's one dimensional, it's going to be happy about it and unpack it into a C buffer. And then you can operate on that. Um, in this case, it's actually very simple. Since it's C space now, I'm no longer going to use the Python for loop. What I'll do instead is um, I'm going to uh, use a, uh, an integer loop for i in range uh, len incomes. Um, is this actually going to work in Cython 026? That's a good question. It might not. If it does not, uh, so in 027, this is going to work. Um, in 026, I think you still have to say uh, income shape zero, as you would know from NumPy probably, right? In the size of the first dimension. So integer loop over uh, the length of the array that we got in. And then in here, I'll just say we sum up incomes at i and run our function on the value at that point. And that's about it, I think. So I'll try to compile it. And looks like Tyson is happy with that. Yep, still the same result. 
now passing in an, uh, a NumPy array. So I changed uh, the input from incomes, that's the list, to incomes NumPy, which is the NumPy array. Um, gives me 24%, the expected value. And now when I run this, we had 11 milliseconds. So we'll use 11.1. So that is much faster. And that's already a factor of five compared to the NumPy version. Uh, another factor of 2.7 compared to the last version we had. And um, a factor of 280 compared to the Python version. OK. Is this clear to everyone? Any questions here regarding memory use? I mean, the, the syntax is basically modeled after what you would have in NumPy. So in order to get a slice, a single dimensional slice, you would just put a colon in. And that's pretty much what the would be used as a syntax here. OK? Yep. Sorry, again. Um, so the question was, uh, when I had this, uh, the, the Python for loop uh, for x in the incomes array now, uh, why did that still work? Well, it still worked because uh, NumPy arrays actually support iteration. Um, I mean, we could actually optimize the same thing in Cython as well. We now know that it's a memory view, and we can say you can actually iterate over a one-dimensional memory view. Why not? We can do that efficiently for you. Um, so yes, I mean, that would be a nice feature. <laughs> I'll note that down somewhere. Um, yeah, but I mean, this is, it's kind of good enough. OK, and it's, it's about how much? Three times faster? What did we have before? Uh, yeah, 2.7 times. OK, so using memory views here uh, and using NumPy arrays as input made a big difference again. Mm -hmm. OK, now I'll uh, show you one more thing here. Uh, when I compile this with size minus a again, um, there's one little thing down here. Uh, these two lines are yellow, which is a bit unexpected. Um, but what it does internally is um, it plays it safe and tries to avoid crashes if you run over the, uh, the size of the array. Um, and since I actually know that I'm not running over the size of the array because that's exactly the range I'm iterating over, I can tell Scython, please don't do that. I can take care of myself. I know what I'm doing. So I can say uh, C import Cython. That's the magic Cython module, which uh, has some nice functionality. And amongst other things, it has um, uh, a decorator bounce check, which allows me to disable bounce checks. And now you can see that the bound check is apparently gone. So whenever i is too large for the array, it's just going to crash for me, which is fine because I know it's not too large. That's me knowing it. And I'm telling the compiler, you know, I know better. And now when I run that again, uh, same result here. And for the speed, what do I get? It's a bit faster. OK, tiny bit. Not a huge difference, but yeah. It's getting closer to the factor three compared to the list version. OK, so these are little little tweaks that I can do here and there. Um, once I know my, that my code is correct and it's actually running and it does the right thing in all cases, I can start uh, disabling safety measures that Cython provides for me. Okay, 
what else do we have? Um, there's another, another uh, exercise here, um, which you can also try at home and then talk to me afterwards. Uh, that's one more thing you can do. Um, now to speed this up, and that's parallelizing the code. So far, it's all running one thread, um, the whole calculation. And now what I can do is I can use OpenMP uh, to use multi-threading because my, my laptop has enough cores. It actually has just two cores in this case, but you know, multi-threading and um, so, sorry, hyper-threading and yeah, it's, it's a bit faster than just one thread. So I can actually use um, the the power that my laptop has, uh, the the different cores, and parallelize my code, um, which is trivial in this case because we're doing the same thing on each of the items. So this is uh, trivially parallelizable. Um, and all I have to do is to tell Cython to use parallel threads rather than one thread. Um, so as I said, I'm using OpenMP for that. So you need a C compiler that supports it. Uh, for a while, CLang has not supported it. Uh, I don't know if that changed along the way. Um, uh, if you have GCC, then this is going to be enough. I just have to tell um, the, the distutors build that uh, the C compiler needs um, a compile argument fopenmp and the linker needs that too. Um, and then when I compile this, it's actually not going to change anything because I haven't changed my code yet. But that's the first thing I have to do, just checking that it works. Okay, so the um, OpenMP integration apparently worked. If it does not work for you, um, then it's probably a C compiler that's missing OpenMP support or something like that. Um, uh, now, what I can do here is, uh, this is, I'm using an integer loop to run over my array, and all I have to change is, um, um, I'll just change this, uh, the import here. Uh, Cython has a parallel module. Is that what it's spelled? Yep. Um, and that comes with a p range function, uh, which just changes one letter uh, compared to range, but uh, a lot in terms of functionality. And all I have to do now is change range into p range, which makes it a parallel range loop. Um, otherwise, I don't have to change anything. It's just still running over the whole length of the array. But now it's doing that in parallel. And OpenMP allows me to say how many threads I want to use here. Um, there's an argument called num threads. I have to look that up so you don't have to know it either. Um, so I use four threads here, and another thing that I have to do uh, is I, for this loop I have to disable, so I have to get, um, have to unlock the gill, because otherwise I won't get parallelism, right? The gill is uh, the the lock in C Python that guards basically everything, every access to the interpre interpreter. Uh, so the gill is the thing that makes C Python fast because it doesn't have to do, you know. Uh, lower level locking in all sorts of places. It just has one lock. Uh, and so it runs very fast um, when single threaded. But um, since my code is already using uh, plain C code for the execution, uh, I do not need the gill because it does not do any Python interaction. It does not need the Python runtime. And since the gill is only there to guard, the, to, to safely guard the Python runtime, I can release the gill. Do Python, let Python do other stuff in the meantime if it wants to, and just start a couple of C threads uh, that run my plain C code here uh, efficiently in parallel. Okay, so one more argument, no gil, true. And that's it, that's all I have to change. Um, so I changed the range loop into a P range, um, said I want four threads to run this, this loop, and I want to release the gill while it's running. And then when the loop is done, it's going to reacquire the gill uh, and thus lock things down to single thread again. So I'll compile this. Got a little warning, so I did something wrong. 
Ah, uh, yes, obviously. Um, so what it tells me is uh, calling a function that requires the gil is not allowed without the gil. Um, why is that? Because I did not tell Siphon that it's actually safe to call this function without the gil. So there's a check in Siphon. Um, whenever I release the gil, and that's something really nice in comparison to writing actual C code. So if you've ever written um, a C extension in C and released the gil somewhere, it's probably going to suck fall at some point. There's a suck fall at some point. Um, this can hap not happen that easily in Cython because Cython does some checking. It tells you whenever you try to do Python operations without owning the gil. Okay? And so uh, what I have to tell it here is this is a function that can be called without holding the gil. And then what Cython will do is it'll check that function and make sure that that function does not use any Python code either, into any Python interaction either. Okay? So it's going to check that function for me. It's going to check my loop for me. I'm going to see that I'm calling that function which allows me to, be, to call it without the gil. And so it's, it's basically checking the whole execution chain, the whole uh, call chain uh, for no gil safety. And since it's all no gil safe, it's not using any Python interaction, uh, it's going to say, all fine, and it's hopefully going to compile it for me. Still got a warning, which is fine. That's just an OpenMP warning. It's a warning, not an error. So it's now, uh, it has now uh, compiled my code for me, and I should get the same result, but it should be faster because I'm now using four threads to run it rather than just one. And we're down to six milliseconds. So that's another factor of 1.6 or 1.7 faster than the previous memory view uh, version. And it's a factor of 500 faster than the Python version. Okay? Okay. Um, so the question was, why did I have an auto pickle up here, auto pickle faults? I should also have that in the solution down there. Um, that is a, a new feature in uh, in Cython 026. Uh, previously, um, extension types, so native class implementations, uh, were not pickleable. Now they are. So there's automatic pickling support, and that also applies to memory views. And so the memory view I'm using here would actually be capable of you know, pickling it, dumping it to disk, and reloading it, and I didn't care. It just loads up my program without being useful. So that's why I'm disabling the auto pickle um, in order to avoid the code overhead. That's it. It's a really nice feature, but it's, it's just not used here. Okay, so that brings us down. Yeah, factor of 500, and even compared to the NumPy version, we're now at a factor of 9. Okay. And then I'm pretty much through with the main part of my tutorial. Any more questions regarding this? Okay. Question was about data dependencies when I'm parallelizing my loop. Um, and I'm not just using incomes i, I'm using incomes somewhere else in the array. Um, uh, it's not a problem if, if you stick with, with that kind of scenario. Um, if you're only reading from the array, that's fine. You can concurrently read from throughout the array. Uh, it's probably going to slow down your algorithm a bit if you do random assess in the array rather than just running through it once. Uh, simply because, you know, memory bandwidth uh, becomes more important in that case. Uh, actually, at, at that level, people have to care about memory bandwidth, right? I mean, you don't really have to care about that if you're dealing with, with Python code somewhere, but if you go in that deeply native, uh, then memory bandwidth actually becomes important. Um, and uh, so as long as you're, you're only doing uh, read access to your array, that's not a problem. It can be done concurrently uh, across all threads. 
uh, any way you like. Um, but you obviously run into the um, thread concurrency problems when you're doing write assess in an array. There was one more. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How would you actually distribute packages that actually include C, uh, Python? Okay, uh, so distribution, um, how does distribution of Python, of, of Cython code work? Um, in exactly the same way as it works for other native extensions. So, um, I mean, we've been using NumPy here. NumPy is a native extension. So, um, uh, I mean, there, there are lots of native libraries or binary uh, libraries in, in, in the Python world uh, that you can get from PyPI. So um, we have integration, integration with uh, distutils. Um, basically, what you would do from your setup high script is uh, you start with your, your Cython code, which is commonly uh, written in PYX files, PYX, um, which, uh, well, I would say stands for uh, Python extended, maybe. Um, PIX. So uh, you write your Cython code in PIX files, and then uh, we provide a Cythonize function um, where you can just say uh, Cythonize all my PIX files that you find in my project, for example. Um, and Cythonize will generate uh, extension objects. So distributed extension objects from that that you can gen then pass into the setup function. And from that point on, this utils will take care of compiling your extension into uh, binary modules. And then you probably end up uh, building wheels from that and distributing them to PyPI. Okay. Uh, so in your testing code, you're passing in the income to the monthly amount. Mm -hmm. Um, question was, uh, when I'm passing, in, so I'm currently passing in a NumPy array with the data, what if I had a C array coming from some C library, for example, um, spits out some, some C data, C memory um, that holds the data, uh, what would I do with that? Um, uh, if I had that case, I would probably split up my function. Um, and uh, so I would unpack I would provide a Python function that still is able to unpack the memory view uh, and then uh, drop the actual code into some CDEF function that I use internally, uh, say, say internal um, text, uh, average text rate, and it would receive, uh, it would do the same thing with the expected C interface, so uh, C double pointer data and uh, say size T length. Um, and then I would deal with that. So I would use the length here and um, just uh, use the array. This is how, how you would do uh, C array indexing in Python, pretty much like in C. And um, then here, in order to do the conversion, I would call my function uh, and delegate to it. So that would just be a plain C function. And um, I would do something like uh, take the address of incomes zero and length of incomes or incomes shape zero. Uh, and then just pass that into my function. So this would have the exactly the same performance characteristics, characteristics, characteristics as before. Um, uh, same speed, exactly the same speed. Uh, the unpacking of the NumPy array will be done in this wrapper function here. And um, if internally I had some, as I said, some, some C function returning some buffer, um, then it would return it as a double pointer and a length. That's the normal C interface that you would expect. And I would just pass that into my internal function. 
Um, that way, I could use uh, both data sources, a C data source and a Python data source, uh, both using exactly the same algorithm. Um, just, I would then also move the bounce check down here. Um, using exactly the same implementation, uh, but you know, it's, it's more, more versatile for me now because I can use it in more cases. Okay, there was another question up there. Uh, we can try. We can try if that makes a difference. You can do that. I mean, it's uh, that's perfectly fine for uh, memory views. So instead of saying this is an arbitrary memory view, I can say, um, I mean, this the the previous version supported actually arbitrary memory views, right? So you could do slicing and pass in a NumPy slice rather than a plain array, right? Um, when I, do, I need a, uh, when I say I need a stride of one here, then it's going to reject input that does not have a stride of one, and I can no longer in, uh, pass in NumPy uh, slices. Okay, let's see if that makes a difference. Uh, so I have to revert that back to incomes shape zero, and anything else? Data was incomes, and I think that's it. Yeah, so it's compiled it. Let's see. Yeah, exactly the same speed. Okay. And that, um, so it's, it is using strides internally, strides for the, the offset calculation. Um, and apparently the, the C compiler well, it, it sees the uh, the index calculation and is apparently capable of generating sufficiently efficient code from that to avoid big overhead for the stride calculation. And this is this is C and C compilers are surprisingly smart sometimes. <laughs> That's also a nice nice thing about um, about developing in Python because like when we're generating C code, um, or when we write the code that generates C code. Uh, we always know that there's a C compiler cleaning up after us, right? So we don't have to do all optimizations ourselves. We just have to tell the C compiler uh, well enough uh, how the code works that we've generated to make it understand how it can optimize it. And that's it. Otherwise, it's, it's just going to do all the, the native adaptations and everything. Um, question was, can you use, well, essentially, can you use OpenMP pragmas in Cython code? Um, you can't, because they wouldn't be passed through into the C code. Uh, and um, you also probably wouldn't. Um, I mean, there are some features in OpenMP, uh, or there might be some features that you could end up wanting, but we don't support. Um, but we support, actually support quite a bit of OpenMP, of what it provides. Um, we have, um, uh, I mean, one thing I didn't tell you is, uh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm doing the, the sum calculation here, and this is uh, one function global variable that I'm doing the, um, the sum over. Uh, uh, and I still end up with one result despite having a parallel loop here. Right? Um, that's because plus equals is actually special in P range. When I do uh, income equals income plus X, this is different. <laughs> um, so uh, what the plus equals does is uh, it turns the income variable into a global, what's it called? Regression variable, something like that. So um, it, 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 it's, um, a variable that's global to all threads, and the sum that I built in that variable has been accumulated back after the, the threads have run. Okay? That's for the plus equals. Um, when I spell it like this, then the income will be thread local, 
and every thread will build their own sum separately, and I won't get the same result. And And so this is the kind of the, the it's ex the expected way to spell it, and I get the expected output. It's so you can compare it to um, this rule in Python that assigning to a function local variable makes it local, right? Um, that's because uh, that's the expected behavior when you assign to a variable inside of a function. In 99.9% .9 of the cases, you want it to be a local variable. That's why you're assigning it to it, right? And that's f why for the point something percent of the cases where you actually wanted to change a global variable, that's the global keyword. And it's exactly the same thing. I mean, um, if you're using plus, plus equals here, in almost all cases, you want a global sum and not a thread local something. Right? And that's why we just do it that way. It's use case optimized. More questions? Yes. Yeah. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, so we still have about 15 minutes uh, for the rest of the tutorial, and I can show you an example um, uh, where I'm actually wrapping an external C library. Because that is one of the, um, it's, it's an extremely common uh, use case for Cython. Um Here. Uh, different notebook, so you won't find that. I think I actually handed out that notebook too. Um, drop the header. Uh, that's the uh, intro, uh, intro quick uh, notebook. It should be in the, in the zip file. Um, so what I'm doing here is, uh, well, you, you probably won't be able to compile this because you'll need Lua for it, which you might not have installed. Um, uh, so I've actually written uh, a Lua wrapper, which is called Looper. Um, which allows you to uh, use Lua code from Python. Okay, so this is an actual example similar to what Looper does. Uh, and I'm, so this is a Cython implementation of kind of a, a minimal wrapper for running Lua code from Python. And for that, I'm linking against um, the Lua JIT library, which is a, a JIT implementation of Lua. Um, for that, I'm saying, and I'm telling uh, Cython, or I'm actually telling distutils where it can find the LuaJIT header files and the LuaJIT library. Okay? I would normally do that for my setup pie script. Um, since I'm, I'm using the, uh, the, the Jupyter notebook here, I'm, can, I can do it right in my cell. Um, which obviously is not portable. So if I wanted to compile this in, in uh, Windows, for example, then uh, it wouldn't be able to find, well, user include, what's that, right? Um, uh, here it works for me because I'm on Linux. Um, so this is where the, the widget header files are installed. Uh, I can configure the whole thing from my setup high script as well. So I can pass in configuration into the, the Cythonize function that we had. I can tell it where to find external libraries, external header files, all that. So I can set that up in my setup high script uh, so that Cython knows how to configure the build for me. Okay. Um, uh, the example we had was, uh, I, was uh, I was just saying um, C import, libc math, and that's it. Right? Um, that works because the uh, declarations of the math header file uh, that comes with libc um, are shipped with, uh, as part of Cython. So uh, Cython has declarations for a part of libc, um, for some parts of POSIX, uh, for libcpp, so the, the STL in C++, um, for the CPython API, uh, and I think a couple of more things, OpenMP, a couple of functions that you can call an OpenMP. Um, so this is all pre-declared, and you can just say C import this, and you're done. Okay, so when you need, um, sorry, when you need a C++ vector, for example, you can just see, say, 
from libcpp vector c import vector and you can use this stl vector in your Python code that's it i can also show an example of that in a minute um if you're using your own c library uh, then you have to pre prepare the to provide the declarations yourself um, this is done using um, an expression cdf extern from some header file uh, this is starting a block where you declare external functions and as you can see here this is probably not the complete content of the lua header files and there's way more in that right but that's uh, all i need for my code so i don't need to repeat everything that's in the header i just need to uh, tell cython what's there that my program is going to use because the c compiler afterwards will actually see the complete header right so my, my generated c code will say include lua header Right, so the C compiler will see the whole thing, and Cython only has to know about the stuff that I'm using. So what I did was I looked through the, the Lua documentation and copied out everything that I needed. Uh, that includes a struct, which is the interpreter state of the Lua runtime, then a function to create a new runtime, uh, close and clean up the runtime, load Lua code into a buffer and compile it, um, then do some stack operations on the Lua stack and so on and so, on and so forth, a couple of enums, uh, a couple of conversion functions, and that's all I need. So I copied, literally copied those out of the header file um, uh, in here into my, my pix file. I would normally copy those into an external declarations file. So rather than copying it in my use only here pix file, my source file, I would uh, use a pxd file. So uh, pix declarations file, um, because that allows me to reuse the declarations in multiple Cython modules. Okay, it's it's sort of like a header file just for Cython. And now, uh, once Cython knows that these C functions exist, um, I can write a Python function here which takes Lua code as an argument. In this case, I have to convert it to a byte string because that's what Lua expects. So I can take um, a Python text string, Unicode string, uh, and pass it into Lua, and the function needs to convert it here. Then I create a new runtime. Uh, the return value there is null on an error, so I just say if there's no uh, if if there was an error in Lua, then raise a memory error for me. Very common pattern in Python. Right. So whenever you call malloc or some initialization function and it fails and the documentation says if null pointer returned here, then memory allocation failed, in Cython you would just say if not pointer, raise memory error done. Right. Um, and then since I have to clean up the whole thing afterwards, I say uh, I open a try block and in the finally I say clear the Lua top and close the runtime, clean everything up. Okay, so I'm using try finally in order to make sure that I'm not leaking any memory, I'm not uh, leaving the Lua runtime in, in some illegal state um, here. Uh, and try finally is perfect for that. And that's also, like again, that's the, that's the mix that you see in Cython code between uh, Python and C, right? Try finally, if there's an exception raised from my code, then in the finally block, I do some C cleanup, right? Safe thing to do. Okay, what do I do in this uh, try block here? I load the data into Lua, uh, compile it there. If that fails, I raise a syntax error. Um, then I call the compiled code. If that fails, I raise some runtime error. I could try to get some, some error message from Lua there and, and put it as an error message in. Um, and then I look at the Lua stack. Uh, and assert that what I actually expected was I expected a number back. That's the only thing I can convert here. Um, so my Lua code has to return some number, uh, and then I convert that into a Python number. And when you look at this function here, Lua to number returns a float. So it looks up some value on the Lua stack and returns a C float. And uh, when in my Python function or in my Cython function, I just say return that C float, then it turns into a, uh, into a Python float. Okay. 
Okay, and here's some Lua code. So I'll just hope that compiles. Yeah. Not initialized. Uh, try that again. Okay, that's compiled with warnings. I guess that's fine. <laughs> and it executes my Lua code. Okay, and returns 55 as a result. So that's just a recursive Fibonacci as you would expect from, you know, running stupid code as an example. Yeah. And so this is basically how you would wrap an external library. And the interface, the Python interface is really nice. It's just Python function, pass in code. And internally, it does all the ugly setup, C management, something stuff, uh, create some, some C state, clean it up, do safe memory management, do failure handling, all at the C level. And you, you can't see any of that from, from the Python level. OK. Anything else there? Another question. Uh, creating NumPy arrays from C arrays. Um, so basically, you have some, some memory blob there and you want to wrap it in a NumPy array. Uh, there is a NumPy API function for that, a C API function. Um, I, that's, that's another thing. We also have the, the NumPy C API wrapped, uh, so pretty clear. So you can just say C import NumPy and then do stuff from there. Call C API functions of NumPy, and that's one of those. Guess that's the last question. That's the expected question. <laughs> I hear that at all conferences lately. Um, people always say, um, so there's this, this, this typing module in Python 3.5, and why don't you support that? Wouldn't that be the obvious thing to do? Sort of. Um, it's, it wouldn't be entirely obvious, because um, it would still be limited to the typing system that you could uh, properly use from Python. So for example, um, all the, the Lua wrapping here would be impossible to do with, uh, with any, any Python-level typing. Right? Because that you simply wouldn't be able to declare an external C function and actually call it from Python code. Um, so uh, what this, this syntax would allow you to do is you could write Python code uh, and add um, uh, signature annotations in Python syntax and Python 3 syntax uh, that would be interpreted by Cython in order to basically optimize your code when it's compiled. Right? Um, and yes, that is possible. Um, so uh, recently someone, someone came up and, uh, so, okay, there are a couple of things to that. One is um, we do have support for annotated Python code. Uh, so um, that's when you import this Cython module, this magic module uh, in Python code, um, it actually exists. So you can say import Cython. Um, then it provides some uh, data types that you can use uh, and some, some cast functions and, and stuff like that. Uh, for example, there's a Cython.int or Cython.float or Cython.double or something like that. So they are all C types uh, provided by that and someone converted that to um, a typing stop. So there's now uh, typing support so for, the, for the typing model for PEP484 uh, um, style typing. Um, uh, which allows you to uh, use Cython types in type annotations. Um, thing is, uh, Cython itself does not pick them up yet. But that's probably doable. So there's work going on in that direction, um, but there are also limits to that because you can't get beyond the level of what Python allows you to do. You can optimize Python code with it, but you can't go native. Okay, question was, is there any integration with the uh, IPython debugger? 
um, can you basically debug Python code from IPython when it, when it crashes and you say debug something? Um, well, there is support for GDB. So uh, you can do GDB uh, debugging at the Python source level. Um, there originally was support for Python debugging, so you could use GDB for Python source level debugging. And someone added uh, Python support for that, so you can now do three source level debugging. You can debug at the C level, at the generated C code level, at the Python source code level, and at the Python source code level, uh, all three using GDB. But that does not give you Python debugger support in that sense. Um, there's actually work being done, or there has been, been work done uh, in PyCharm for supporting uh, Python debugging. And that's at the uh, source code line level uh, or using, using the actual Python debugger. So I don't know what the actual state there is, but yeah, it's, there's, there's, there are capabilities in that direction. Okay, uh, I think that's pretty much it. Um, I'm going through and I hope you learned something. <laughs>